In the previous uh, video, we have discussed about how the neural networks can be useful for segregating things into different categories. We have seen two things, one is linearly separable and the other one is a non-linearly separable or which is unseparable we can say. And we have taken two examples for that, one is actually a simple AND gate or an OR gate where we can easily separate based on simple addition based, right. So, when we add the two numbers, what is the sum so that we can have some sort of equation, a linear equation using which we have separated. And in the case of an XOR gate, which is actually a modulo 2 addition and in that case, the simple addition may not be useful and hence, the XOR gate is actually becoming uh, linearly not separable. So, what are all the other options we can do? Uh, one option of course, we can go for uh, increasing the number of dimensions or reducing the number of points. So, these two options are there for the XOR gate to solve the problem. So, basically we can increase the number of uh, layers that is available in the uh, network. So, that is actually the basic thing we of course, we have seen and after that we discussed about the learning paradigms. In the learning paradigms, how we are going to teach the network, right? That is actually the basic thing. And there are basically two methods are available. One is called a non-associative and the second one is called associative, of course, we have discussed. And I will just give you a summary of that before entering into the next session. So, here in the case of non-associative, an organism requires the properties of single repetitive. So, in the case of non-associative, there are two different events are happening. And from each and every event, I will be getting something. For example, whenever you are uh, uh, sitting, right, and listening to your radio, right. So, so, initially you cannot concentrate on the radio, right. But after some time, what happens? You will be getting accustomed to it. So, in that case, it is non associative. Whenever I am giving some action, then there will be a replicative action will be there. And again, we have seen also the associative. That is again one action followed by the other stimulus action or what is going to be the effect. So, this is what actually we have discussed in the previous class. And also we have seen two uh, variations, one is called classical conditioning and operant conditioning. Of course, yesterday we have not discussed, so in the previous section, so I am not uh, again uh, repeating the same thing. And it is going to be the non-associative learning, it is a variety of learning and uh, which is an association between the stimuli does not take place. To be more descriptive, in non-associative learning, the behavior and stimulus are not paired or linked together, right. So, this is what uh, a non-associative learning. So, whenever we are learning something, then how the learned data is stored in the memory, right. So, that is actually how the human memory stores the data. When the human memory is there, it has two types of memory. One is actually called as a short term memory and the second one is going to be the long term memory. So, long term memory means say for example, the date of birth or anything which is will be there in the mind for a longer period and short term memory will be there something a memory which should be there only for some one week or one day or something like that. It is going to be comparably a short period it will be there. So, there are basically two types of memory our normal brain has. One is called as the short term memory and the second one is called as the long term memory and inputs to the brain are processed into the short term memory which last for a few minutes, actually few minutes we can say, right. Only after the few minutes, immediately we will be losing that memory content. And the information is downloaded into long term memory. Suppose, if it is going to be a vital parameter or vital information which has to be stored, in that case, this content of this short term memory will be downloaded into the long term memory for permanent storage. So, this can be having days, months or years. I think we can easily recognize some our teachers, right. So, who have taught us more than 10 years or 20 years back. So, the short term memory and the long term memory are operated differently in the human brain and the capacity of the long term memory is very, very large. So, we can have a lot of data that can be stored in the long term memory. And this is going to be the input stimulus. Whenever the input stimulus is given, it will be given to the short term memory initially. And whenever the important is, the information is important and that has to be stored into the long term memory that will be downloaded. And whenever we are going to have a recall process, the data can be recalled either from the short term memory or from the long term memory and the data is actually called recalled here. And the recall process of these memories is distinct from the memories themselves. Now, we will be seeing a, seeing a few learning algorithms. So, here define an architecture dependent procedure to encode pattern information into the weights. 
normally what we have so far seen is a network architecture we have seen. What is actually a network architecture? I think that will be having uh, some sort of inputs will be there and there will be some mathematical functions will be there, right. We can call it as a layer and a nodes and the output of this nodes are connected to another set of nodes, maybe a single layer perceptron or multi layer uh, perceptron, something like that and there will be some function will be given to that and the output will be given here. So, this is actually what is what happening here and also we can have some bias and all those things, right. So, we can also add a bias to this. So, we can call it as a x 1 to x n and the bias can be always 1 and each and everything will be having its own weights, right. So, w 1 to w n. So, already we have discussed the architecture of a neural network. Now, what is actually the learning algorithm? So, in that case my x is going to be the input which we cannot touch and y most probably will be the desired output. So, we cannot touch. Suppose, if you want to do something, you have to adjust the w 1 parameters or the weights are to be continuously updated, right. So, that for any input, I should be able to get the desired output, right. So, the updation process of this weight is actually basically the learning algorithm that will be used here. We will see it now first define an architecture dependent again it depends on the architecture we have seen so many right. So, we have seen uh, feed forward or uh, recurrent networks there are many variations are also there and it is a architecture dependent procedure to encode the pattern information into the weights. So, whatever we have to teach that information should be encoded into the weights that are available here. So, the weights are going to be continuously tuned that is actually the process of learning the system and learning proceeds by modifying the connection strength of course, the weight is the connection strength and the learning is data driven. So, it depends on the data that is passing through this right. A set of input and output patterns derived from a possibly unknown probability distribution right. Say for example, already in the first section we have said right. Suppose, if there are some minimum inputs and minimum outputs, we can easily find out what is going to be the relation between the input and output. Suppose, if it is going to be a very complicated right, I think I have said right. For example, a credit has to be given for some person right. So, what are all the inputs and how a decision taken uh, whether the credit can be given to a person, a loan can be given to a person or not. We will be taking some n number of inputs and each and every input will be having its own influence. For example, a, what is going to be the salary of that person, what is going to be the credit already, what is the credit or some sort of civil score we can say right. So, how he is handling the credit in the past and the second one is where he is going to reside. Suppose, if the person is residing at the same place for some some period say for example, again for one year or two year, then that person may be reliable the person. So, that we can give the credit. Suppose, every six months he is wants to change the location where he resides. In that case, the reliability of that person may decrease again if the person is there for long period again the reliability may decrease of course, but in these cases there may be some parameters which is going to influence whether the loan can be given his what is going to be his spending culture right. So, what are all the things he is actually spending. So, there will be n number of parameters will be there that will influence whether a person can be given a loan or not. So, these are all the set of inputs right. So, and this may form different probability distributions right. So, there will be some sort of non-linearity that exists between all these factors. So, in this case the first case the output pattern might specify a desired system response for a given input pattern. So, we are giving some input and we know what is going to be the output right. So, we need some sort of desired system response and we can just check whether the system is going to give the same desired response or not. So, in that case the learning involves approximating the unknown functions as described by the given data. This is actually the first category of the things and alternatively the data might comprises patterns. So, in that case there is nothing to learn right. So, but there will be some sort of pattern that may exist with the available data uh, that naturally cluster into some number of unknown classes. Say for example, what is going to be the rain available in Karnataka right. So, in that case actually there will be some part will be experiencing heavy rains, 
some part will be experiencing moderate rains and some part can be experienced in small rains or minimum rains. So, in that case how you are going to cluster different cities based on the amount of rain that has been experienced. So, in those cases we will be classifying different cities or different areas based on the amount of rain that has been uh, that is received. So, in this case the learning problem involves generating a suitable classification of the sample. So, there are going to be n number of samples with some sort of data available. So, based on the data available say for example, in our case what is going to be the rain that is coming uh, come that is experienced by that city either it may be in mm or cm whatever it is. So, based on that how you are going to classify the data available that. So, these two types of learning algorithms can be useful for the network uh, neural network issues. So, the first one is actually called as a supervised learning. So, in that case the supervised learning in the sense we know what is what is actually the output right and we are going to give the system and the system will be giving some output we can compare whether the system is giving the desired output or not. Suppose, if the system is giving desired output fine. So, no need for any changes in the system, no in the network actually already learnt and it is working properly. Suppose, if the system is not giving a proper output, in that case I have to tune some parameters already I told you x weights, x is actually the input, w is the weight and y is the output. So, the only tunable parameter here is actually the weight and the bias of course, these two things we can just change it. So, by changing these values we are going to make the system learn about the concepts and this concept is actually called as the supervised learning. So, in this case the data comprises a set of discrete samples drawn from the pattern space. Again you can just see there is going to be a pattern space right say for example, the system may be consisting of something around 1000 data available. So, we are not going to train with all the 1000 data we will be having a small set of data. So, maybe so at the same time it should be small at the same time it should be sufficient for the system to learn everything right. So, we are going to select a, a set of space available here. So, we are going to have a set of data and from this pattern space each sample is related to one particular input vector and this input vector x r is actually it belongs to this group r to an output vector d k which belongs to a r p. So, there are going to be different dimensions and different planes may be there and in that case the t is equal to x k d k where k runs from 0 1 to q. So, this is actually a simple expression that is actually useful for the supervised learning. Here the set of samples describe the behavior of an unknown function a function which relates r n to r p which is to be characterized. Of course, whenever we are going for some sort of supervised learning the systems should also handle effectively the noise signals. We can just see here there is actually a graph available and in this graph a few points are on the line, but there are a plenty of points that is available on on off the line because there is going to be a influence of noise in the signal and an example function described by a set of noisy data points. So, this is going to be the noisy data points. So, whenever I am going to have the what is the desired output for a given input and what is the output that is given by the system, what is the error and how I can reduce this that that concept is actually called as the supervised learning. Normally, the supervised learning procedure can be explained using this simple diagram. Of course, a basic neural network architecture is given here, there will be some inputs of course, I have already drawn this right. So, there will be an input vector right, it is not a single input, it is going to be a vector input vector we can say. Say for example, it can be x 1 to x k right, x 1 to x k are the different input vectors are available and this is going to be the uh, node right, the first layer of nodes are available and there is going to be second layer, third layer of course, we can have it. Normally, we will be now dealing with a single layer and there will be some output will be coming some function is going to come here and for this particular output s k for one particular x k I am getting an output as s k and I need the output of d x. Now, what is the difference between s k and d x right. So, when you compute this minus this or the difference between these two things I will be getting the function error and this error 
is used to tune this weights that are actually useful here. Right? So, here the error information is fed back for the network adaptation. So, the network adopts itself by tuning its weight factor in order to minimize the error. So, it is going to be a iterative process. Right? So, we will be uh, explaining this back propagation algorithm of course, in the model 2, but here this is actually the basic concept where a network is getting tuned or getting learning something from the inputs. So, here we can see we want the system to generate an output d k, right? we can say right? here actually my input is x k. So, they have given a corresponding d k is given in response to an input x k and we say that the system has learned the underlying map if a stimulus x k dash close to x k elicits a response of x k dash which is sufficiently close to d k. So, when I when I am giving a x k and I expect a output of d k and when these two outputs are almost same right. So, the s k and the d k is going to be the same. Now, I am going to make a small delta in change here. So, here actually instead of x k I am going to give some x k plus 1 right. So, there will be some delta changes given here. Now, what should happen actually? Again, there will be a delta change in the x k should be there and the system should be able to generate what is the output that is from d x. right? So, when this has happened, then we can just say the system has adopted to a new value. The system has learnt what should be the output for any number of inputs. So, this is actually called as the supervised learning procedure. The unsupervised learning, right? So, the unsupervised learning in the sense we do not have anything to train, right? So, what, what else actually we can do? So, we are not going to train any network, right? Normally, when the supervised learning is there, we can give the input and we know what is the output expected. But in the case of unsupervised learning, there is no supervisor. So, we will be giving some input and it will be giving some output, right? But what we can do with that sub, uh, the uh, unsupervised networks. We will just see here. In the case of unsupervised learning, it provides the system with an input x k of course, same thing and it allows to self organize its weights. So, here again the weights will be adjusted, but how the weights are adjusted? In order to generate the internal prototype of sample vectors, right. So, there is no teaching input involved here. So, there is no teaching is involved here, right fine. The system attempts to represent the entire data set by employing a small number of prototypical vectors enough to allow the system to retain a desired level of discrimination between the samples. Say for example, I am getting so many inputs here, right. Say for example, there are some inputs like coming like this and there are some inputs are coming like this, right. So, you can here you can see these are all actually lines and this is actually a triangle. So, whenever these 8 inputs are given here, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, some 5 inputs here are there, right? I think it is visible to you. So, 5 inputs are there, 5 lines are there and some 4 triangles are there. Whenever you are giving these 9 inputs to your system, the system should be able to classify whether these 4 are actually of one category and these 5 are of one category. So, it is able to classify something it is going to categorize something. In that case, this can be called as an unsupervised learning. So, it is simply a classification, right. So, there is no right or wrong answer or something like that, but based on some parameter, it should be able to classify. Already we have discussed, right, in the case of the under gate. So, what we have seen is something like for uh, first gate 0, 0 my output is 0, 0, 1 my output is 0, 1, 0 my output is 0, for 1 and 1 the output is going to be 1. In that case, we classified so, the for the first three cases, the output is 0 and for the fourth case, the output is going to be 1. So, here actually we can classify. Of course, for the UND gate, we know the output, so we can train it, but in some cases, when there is no definite uh, super, I mean the training sets are available, we can make use of this unsupervised learning and the unsupervised learning is mainly useful for categorization, right. Here we can see, as new samples continuously buffer the system the prototypes will be in a state of constant flux. This kind of learning is often called as adaptive vector quantization. So, what is meant by adaptive vector quantization? We are going to formulate or we are going to adjust the, uh, the values of the w that is the weight factor 
so that whenever the input comes it will be automatically categorized to any of the that is categories that can be available here right say for example in this case it is going to be a lines in this case it is going to be triangles so whenever i am going to give a new input something like this right so something like this and i assume it is completely filled so in that case it should be able to identify it is actually a uh, it's actually a triangle right so based on the shape right then it simply simply finds out whether it is going to be a simple line or it is going to be a triangle so it should be able to distinguish this is what actually the second method i said the clustering and the classification so there are plenty of data is available here already we have seen uh, some examples here and given yeah, so this symbol is actually comes to belongs to right and i think this symbol is not visible in the pdf you just consider it belongs to right it belongs to so here it really it x i belongs to some rn so you have to read like this fine so given a set of data samples x i right and x i belongs to this set of data rn it is is it possible to identify a well defined clusters so this is actually the cluster 1 of all green dots we can say and we have a cluster 2 of all red dots and we are going to have the cluster centroids so this is actually the center point for this and this right so here we can just see into a well defined clusters where each cluster defines a class of vectors which are similar in some broad sense right so it should be able to distinguish the clusters help establish a classification structure within a data set that has no categories defined in advance so initially we will be getting all the dots so all the dots may have some similar parameters something like what the say shape and the size are going to be the same the only distinguishing parameter between these two things is this is actually red color and this is going to be in green color so based on that particular parameter my system should be able to make it into two different clusters right now the classes are derived from the clusters by appropriate labeling so we can label it right in the case of uh, uh, unsupervised learning we will be having a corresponding labels either it can be a simple binary something like ones or zeros already we discussed right so the category can be one and zero or it can be any label say for example red and green it need not be two ever again it can be more categories are also possible right so <coughs> classes are derived from the clusters by appropriate labeling the next thing is the goal of pattern classification is to is to assign an input pattern to one of the finite number of classes so it should be finite it cannot be infinite number of classes right so that is again the distribution may not be possible right so we will be having a finite set of classes here actually two classes are there one is a green class the second one is going to be the red class so any dot that is coming here will be checked for its color if it is almost green color then that will be placed here and if it is red color that will be placed here so something like that we have to do right and the quantization vectors are called as code back vectors right so basically what is the difference between this uh, characteristics of an supervised and unsupervised learning so we have seen two things one is actually the supervised learning where the inputs and outputs are known and uh, initially the system will be given with some random value random value of weights and we will be feeding the inputs and we will be getting some output and we will compare the, the output from the system and the desired output the error whatever the error is used to adjust the weight parameter right that is actually called as the supervised learning and this is actually not for one particular input there is going to be a set of inputs right already i have told you something like we can see there is going to be from x1 right x1 to xn will be there for a set of inputs again there may be more number of samples something like say for example we are going to take a 3 by 3 image right a 3 by 3 image means there is going to be totally simply i am taking a simple small image which will be having 3 by 3 size so we'll be having around 9 pixels will be there right and i want to compare three such images so totally how many inputs are to be given here actually here for 9 uh, pixels inputs here again some 9 pixels here again some 9 pixels so in that case i will be having some 9 inputs can be 9 input nodes can be used so first time the image is given i will say what is going to be the image 
then the second image will be given again the same 9 pixels input will be given and what is the corresponding output and the third 9 pixels will be given and for each and each and every time I can say what is the output of, uh, that is expected from the network and so that I can train it. This is actually a simple method. So, in that case you can see the input is going to be a collection of data. So, we can call it as a input vector, input vector right. So, a collection of data will be continuously fit here. So, here uses the pattern class information of each training pattern right. On the other side in the case of unsupervised learning it is adaptively clusters the patterns to generate uh, decision class code books without any priori pattern class information. So, it does not know what are all the patterns available right. Just it is getting the data it automatically tries to find out what is what may be the cluster pattern and it tries to classify the inputs to different clusters. So, that is actually called as an unsupervised learning. The next thing here is actually the internal parameters adopt using the error correction or gradient descent learning procedures right. So, already I told you right. So, the weights are to be adjusted right. So, how the weights are to be adjusted? The weights can be increased suppose if there is going to be a positive error right. Uh, of course, I am speaking in terms right. Suppose if the value is going to be negative error the weights has to be decreased. Of course, it depends on the programming and uh, what of the manipulation we do. So, by adjusting the weights what we can do is we can train the system and for that particular training we can have the error correction method or gradient descent learning method of course, we are going to see what is that. And in that case the first order difference or differential equations define the learning process. So, since here actually there is no output we are going to classify the first order difference or the differential equations. All right, say for example, d by dx or dou by dou x something like that we can take it at and based on that equations we are going to categorize the different things. Here actually the global error signals govern the learning. So, if for example, suppose if there are going to be some 1000 samples right. So, we will be taking some 1000 samples, we will be computing the 1000 errors and based on this 1000 errors we can average it and based on that average again we can do the weight modification right something like a global error. So, in that case the all the data that will be used here. Here actually it is going to be a local information is useful for here. So, in that case actually there is no uh, global value. So, the data may be coming continuously and uh, for each and every data the system should be able to categorize what is it. So, here the local information is useful for learning and here this is usually done in offline. Right. So, all the data should be available because we know a set of data what are all the inputs what are all the corresponding outputs right. Say for example, I can have a 3 input AND gate 3 input AND gate in the sense the inputs are going to be 3 bits the output is going to be 1 bit. So, 3 means there are 2 power 3 8 combinations are possible in 8 combinations I will be taking some 3 or 4 combinations right uh, for this uh, training this data and for what each and every uh, tra training data what should be the corresponding output again of course, I should be knowing and I should be giving the system to get trained and once it is trained then whenever I am going to give the test data. So, it can be done. So, in that case the entire data set is available offline. So, what is the input and what is the corresponding output everything is available with me. So, the training process or the learning process can happen in the offline, but here the locality allows synapses to learn in real time. So, here the data is coming in real time. So, whenever a data comes the system should be able to find out what is going to be the category of that particular data right. Say for example, already I told you right one example is going to be the rain information in Karnataka. So, whenever a new data comes in then the system can easily classify whether the rain is actually a minimum rain or a moderate or it is going to be a heavy rain. So, something like that the system should be able to classify using this unsupervised learning. So, these are all the two methods that can be useful or two types of learning schemes that is available in the neural network. So, what is going to be the general philosophy of learning right. So, the principle of minimal disturbance. So, it has to adapt to reduce the output error from the current training pattern with minimal disturbance to response already learned. So, already it has learned something 
and I should be able to get a new input data with minimal disturbance. Even if there is some disturbance, then the system should be able to distinguish what is actually the expected output from that. So, this is actually the general philosophy of learning. Now, the error correction and the gradient descent rules. So, these are all of course, how the system can be trained or what is meant by training? Again adjusting the weight parameter. So, how the system weight parameters are tuned. So, for this actually we are having the error correction and the gradient descent rules. The first thing is the error correction rule. So, they alter the weights of the network using a linear error measure to reduce the error the output generated in response to the present input pattern. Right. So, here actually what happens already whatever we have discussed here. The same thing is here with the three important points are one is actually the error should be corrected. Right. Again for that actually we are going to have a set of rules that is actually point number one. The second point is it should be linear. Right. So, there should be some uh, set of equations that can be described. When we are going to have some equations, why I need a network in that case, whether I can write some equations, right. So, why I need a network that may be a question normally everybody is can do that, can may ask. So, whenever actually I am going to have a network, so it will manage some sort of noises, right. So, whenever there is, there is actually a set of equations are there, if some noise inputs are there, then the equations may go completely different. But when a network is trained, right, basically with the set of same equations, but whenever there is some sort of noise signal is there, the network system can effectively handle it. That is actually one advantage. And the second advantage is when the number of inputs are going to be very high, once the system is trained, the system accuracy can continuously improve, right, something, some sort of actually we can see. Uh, every time the system learns from the error. So, even if there is going to be a minimum error, the system learns how to correct that particular error. So, the system accuracy can keep on increasing when we are going to have uh, this type of uh, linear error measures. And also, if there is going to be some minimum non-linearity, that can also effectively handle by the network system, which is not possible in the normal manipulation or normal calculation. So, these are all some of the advantages what we have here. Right. So, in this case a linear error measure to reduce the error in the output generated in response to a present input pattern. So, there will be a set of input patterns will be coming here and for the present input pattern what is going to be the output and what is the error. So, that has to be done and that error has to be corrected and for that particular purpose we are going to have a set of error correction rules. The second one is actually the gradient rules. So, the gradient rules alter the weights of a network during each pattern presentation by employing the gradient information with the objective of reducing the mean squared error, usually average over all training patterns. So, here actually what is, there is going to be a gradient, right. What is meant by gradient? There is going to be a gradient something like this, right. Say for example, uh, we have actually a hill, right. So, assume this is, there is going to be a hill. And I need to have some point here, I want to go here and I am available at this point, right. So, I can move up. So, I am going in the opposite direction. The slope is actually increasing. Here I can come down. So, the slope will be in the opposite direction or I can walk along in the same direction. So, I can have depending upon the scope, what is going to be the slope I am moving and what is the direction actually I am going to move. So, I will be having the gradients, right. So, there is going to be a change in this direction. So, based on that I can finally reach the desired position, right. So, this is actually called as the gradient rule and alter the weights. Of course, the weight has to be modified because of the training of a network during each pattern is presented, right. So, one by one the patterns are actually presented based on the gradient information with the objective of reducing the mean square error. What is actually mean square error? Already we know, right. Normally we will be writing E is equal to R minus B, right. So, what is actually the desired output and what is the current output, right. So, suppose if the first value is A, the second value is B, this is going to be A minus B is actually giving the error. And I am going to square it so that I can find what is going to be the magnitude, what is actually the difference. Either it can be a positive error or it can be a negative error. So, A suppose if A is bigger, 
So, a minus b is going to be a positive number. So, I will be getting a positive output. Suppose if b is bigger, then a minus b is going to give a negative number and when it is squared again I will be getting the magnitude. So, we I bother only about the magnitude. right? So, here in this case I can have a uh, this particular mean squared error. So, and uh, this is actually for one set of inputs. Now, assume actually I am having 100 inputs say for example, uh, a 1 to a 100 and what is the desired output b 1 to b 100 and I will be calculating this and I will be taking the average that is actually the mean squared error and this is usually averaged over the all training patterns. So, whatever the number of training patterns are available, everything will be given and every error will be calculated, this mean squared error, uh, squared error will be calculated and all these things are averaged to find out what is going to be the mean squared error and this mean squared error is actually used to do adjust the weight, fun weight functions. The next one is going to be the learning objective of TLNs, right. So, here actually what we are going to see is of course, we have seen a simple network, right, a TLN is available here and there is going to be an augment input and weight vectors. So, here what we can say is this is actually x k is actually a set of inputs. So, x naught x 1 k up to x n k is available here and the x naught we can simply consider it can be a bias, right. So, bias is always 1 here you can see. So, that the equation will be very simple, right. Suppose, if I put some other value then it may be different. So, what we plan is we are going to fix it at plus 1 and what is going to be the corresponding w naught? Now, this can be your bias, this can be your bias. So, the bias is actually added similar to your normal inputs and normal weights and similarly you are adjusting your weights, you can also adjust the bias value. So, the bias is also considered as one input with a magnitude of 1 and the bias value is added as w naught, right. And the x 1 to x n are the different types of inputs. And already we discussed this first part is going to be a simple summation of all these things x naught plus x naught into w naught plus x 1 into w 1 plus x 2 into w 2 and the summation of up to x n into w n. And it is followed by some activation function where the non-linearity is introduced. And again, again we have seen different activation functions in the previous slides and, and the act output of the activation function will be the output s. So, this is going to be a simple network we can consider. Here actually what we are going to see is the x k is x naught which can be the bias and x 1 k to x n k, right. And x 1 and x n are the inputs, right. You see the difference. The suffix x 1 means this is x 1, this is x 2 up to x n. And what is the top k? That is actually the first set of inputs. So, we go, we are going to call it as a vectors, right. So, here actually we are going to or simply we can say x 1 k, right. <coughs> this can be written as where we can write, I will write. So, here x 1 k can be considered as x 1 at the kth instant, x 1 at the kth instant. So, again the k is actually the number of samples, right. So, again the same example I can give you. So, we are going to have a 3 by 3 pixel an image. So, we have 3 such images are available. So, in that case actually what happens? I have 3 such images. So, this is actually x 1 of 1. This is x 1 of 2, this is x 1 of 3, right. And the second one, this is x 2 of 1, first image. This is x 2 of 2, second image. This is x 2 of 3, third image. So, we are going to have a set of vectors. So, that belongs to the r n plus 1 range. And w k is again a set of weights. So, w 0 k, w 1 k up to w n k again the same thing belongs to uh, the region or uh, n plus 1. So, what is actually the objective of this to design the weights of the TLN, all right. So, the threshold logic network correctly classify a given set of patterns and what is the assumption? A training set of following form is given here. So, here actually T is actually the x k comma d k where k runs from 1 to q and x k belongs to r n plus 1 and d k belongs to 0 and 1 range. What is going to be the desired output? That is actually the d will be in the range of binary values 0 or 1. So, 
is what actually we have here. The output should be either 1 or 0 here. So, when the value of y k is greater than 0, then I should be having a triggering has done. So, I am getting a positive output. When the y k value is less than 0, right, we can say what, uh, what happens to the equal to 0? Again, that can be an arbitrary value, right. So, we can just make it as uh, v k can be greater than or equal to 0, you can say or even we can say greater than 0 alone we can put we will have less than or equal to 0. So, the equal to again because the 0 is actually the classification between these two things. So, you can just write it as uh, greater than or equal to 0, less than or equal to 0, any one of course, we can use it. And each pattern x k is tagged to one of the two classes c naught and c 1. So, in this case actually only two outputs are there the category 1 can be considered as 1 and the category is 2 can be considered as 0, just for assumption I am saying. So, C naught and C 1 denoted by the desired output d k being 0 or 1 respectively. So, what is going to be the learning objective for this T L n's? So, two classes, right, we have already identified by two positive signal states of the T L n, that of course, we have done that. Now, C naught by a signal S y k equal to 0 and C 1 by a signal S y k which is equal to 1. So, when the value of y k of that particular S, right, normally we have seen what is actually S, S is the output here, right. So, when the S of y k is equal to 0, then that particular sample is categorized as C naught when the s of y k equal to 1, then that particular sample is categorized into c 1 category, right. So, what is meant by c naught and c 1 already we discussed, it can be either 1 or 0 in this case, but for different cases it can be different numbers. Normally, for the present situation, we are just dealing with only binary classifications, so, only two classifications are possible. So, c 1 and c 2 or c naught and c 1 we can take only the two classifications are there, right. Now, given two sets of vector x naught and x 1, so there are two inputs, right. So, x naught and x 1 belonging to classes c naught and c 1 respectively. By the learning procedure, such as a solution weight vectors w s that correctly classifies the vectors into their respective classes. Again, we have to see, say for example, my output can be either category 0 c naught or the category 1, right and assume I am going to have some 1000 inputs, I am going to have some 1000 inputs. So, this 1000 inputs should comprise of both categories C naught category as well as the C 1 category, because we cannot train all the data to only one particular category, then the system may not be knowing what is C 1 at all. So, in that case, my training data should be able to give both C naught category as well as C U C 1 category. So, out of this 1000 data what we can do is, we are going to have a sample set of data something around 500 data, right. It is going to be a subset of the original 1000 data available and out of this 500 data, I will be having something around 250 data corresponds to C naught category and the remaining 250 data that corresponds to the C 1 category. So, I am going to use this particular data set for training the network. So, some 250 will be going for C naught and some 250 will be going for C 1, right. So, the same thing here given here, the given the two sets of vector x naught and x 1 and they belong to category C naught and C 1. So, we have to give the test vectors in such a way that they belong to both the categories, then only the system will learn about the both the categories. Suppose, if you are training the system to only one category, the system then it fails to uh, learn about the second category, that is actually the problem. And C 1 respectively, the learning procedure searches a solution weight vector w s, right. So, it is going to find out a value of the uh, w s, right. So, or it can be a weight vector, we can say. So, that correctly classifies the vectors into their respective classes. Now, the context T L is find the weight vector w s such that for all x k that belongs to x 1, right. Again I told you that square you just call it as a belongs to and the s of y k equal to 1 and for all x k belong to x naught, the y k should be equal to 0, 
right. So, again it depends if I am going to take some sample x k which can be from x 1 set or x 0 set. Whenever I am taking the data from the x 1 set my output should be 1. Whenever I am taking this data from the x 0 set my output should be 0. Here again the same thing I told. Whenever I am taking a data from this first 250 I should get the category of C naught. Whenever I take any data from the second category and I am presenting it then the data should be C 1, the output should be C 1. So, that it can classify both the things and the positive inner products translate to a plus 1 signal. So, this C naught can be considered as a plus 1 signal again the naming and all those things again it is arbitrary we can select whichever is convenient we can use it. So, we are just giving it as a category 0 or category 1 we can say like this or numerals we can say plus 1 and 0 or numerals we can say plus 1 and minus 1 again it depends fine. Now, translates to saying that for all x k belongs to x 1 and x k t w s greater than 0 and for x k belongs to x naught x k into t w s. So, what does actually this x k transpose into this particular w s. Right. So, here actually the x k belongs to this category x 1 something like this and in that case the x k transpose what is actually this x k transpose into w y I have to do this simple right because it is going to be what is going to be my inputs there will be some inputs and there will be some vectors and there will be some outputs right whatever may be the variables you give no issues just I am giving these two values right. So, x may be actually more than one set of inputs it is going to be a group of data w is again a group of data and normally x into w will be multiplied. So, simply what we can do instead of having this in we can have it as a vector notation. So, in that case the x k transpose into w s we can easily do a matrix multiplication. So, we can just see the x k t into w s right. So, this value will be corresponding to this s y k. So, here actually x k belongs to x 1 I will be getting 0 value and x k belong to x 0 which is going to equal to x k transpose into w s should be less than 0 right. The same equation of course, that has been rewritten in a, a different format.